Kia ora everyone. I'm talking across the Tasman to Dr. Pran, mate. Um, for me and the audience, would you mind describing to everyone from a sort of general medicine point, what a gastroenterologist is? And then we'll get into uh, what makes you and your team special. Thanks, mate. Um, look, uh, gastroenterology is a field of uh, internal um, medicine. So what we specialize in is the uh, diseases of the digestive tract. Um, that includes everything from the esophagus, stomach, biliary duct, uh, liver, pancreas, uh, small intestine and large bowel. Um, so that's our specialty. So as part of our specialty, we were also considered the plumbers, I think, of the uh, healthcare sector. So, you know, we, we get very proficient with using a fiber optic uh, camera to explore these areas looking for disease. So we deal with a lot of uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, obviously bowel cancer, removal of bowel polyps, um, and various other things, diseases of the bili biliary duct, which we can instrument with our cameras. So we're a very procedural, uh, field, very similar to the cardiologists. Um, most internal medicine is using your brain to come up with a diagnosis, whereas um, I was drawn to gastroenterology because I'm a very hands-on, practical sort of a person. If there's a problem, I just want to see it. Um, yeah. So it, it has always appealed to me. So as part of our specialty, we deal with a lot of irritable bowel syndrome and, you know, just diseases of the gut, uh, which um, a lot of people tend to um, have nowadays. So we're, we're never short of um, short of work. Yeah, that's for, that's for sure. Um, mate, is it is it sort of the tech or the interaction that that uh, makes makes your job great and exciting, or, or um, is that what sort of drew you to it? Um, mate, I kind of just fell into it. Um, I fell into medicine. Um, you know, uh, typical bushy Southeast Asian parents, you know, and, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was a mathematician in school, but um, just got pushed towards medicine, um, which is interesting because, like, as a mathematician, you know, you, you, you become very objective about, uh, about life is the way you view the world can be very black and white. And what I've found in medicine, I've always been uneasy in the field because um, the field's an interesting field. It, it, it no longer really relies on objectivity. Um, so I've, I've always been uneasy in the field and, and, and sort of um, fought some of the dogmas, I think, with, within it. Um, so whilst I enjoy medicine, there's a lot of issues with how we practice, mate. Uh, medicine is a is a bit of a broken paradigm that really focuses on disease rather than that sort of preventative model, which I'm, uh, you know, passionate about, Brian. Mm. You mate, so you, you, with that's with a long your, winded answer to your question. No, it's good. With, with your um, letters beside your name, mate, the uh, Otago University pops up. Uh, how did you end up in Dunedin, bro? Mate, it's. <laughs> It's, it's been a, a hell of a life, uh, Ryan. I, I was born in the middle of a uh, civil war in Sri Lanka and, you know, we, we were sort of, you know, I still have vivid memories of the war. Um, and, you know, I think we would have left when I was about six or seven, ended up in Nigeria, uh, which, you know, it was like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, you know, and um, and uh, we spent a few years there. My dad was this, you know, he was a dentist and he was a wild sort of a guy. He, he loved a good adventure and he dragged us um, along the merry way through Africa. We ended up in Zimbabwe, Southern Africa. Um, and then uh, I remember, you know, just going to him with this ultimatum, which was, please take me to either Australia, New Zealand or Canada. I need to get an education. I, I, I want to be good at what I do because I really didn't see an, a future in Africa. And, and we ended up in New Zealand, mate, down in the deep south. Um, you know, we would have been one of the first ethnic families there um, back then. Um, man, and the people were just welcoming, do you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, we, we, um, I stayed there till I was about 21 when I finished off my medical degree. And um, because it's such a small town, though, like, and I spent probably nine or 10 years there, in this town, I couldn't wait to get out. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've always made it a point to go back and I still consider New Zealand my home. And if they um, ever play the Aussies in the cricket, I, you know, like that's who I'm, who I'm rooting for. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I, um, I've, I've got very fond memories of the place, mate. No, oh, awesome. So what, what school did you end up in, Dunedin? Yeah, I was in Otago Boys High School. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, uh, skinny little cricket playing kid surrounded by all these rugby guys. Um, you know, I was in, uh, you know, I remember fond memories of Richie McCaw, who um, was in my class for most of it, smart, smart guy. And, we, you know, we're surrounded by, by, by rugby players. It's hard to advise at Boys High School. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but, you know, it's um, a very, very good school, uh, very big on their sports. Mm. Um, and great memories of it, mate. It's, um, you know, a great place to grow up. Nice, mate. And you see cricket there. Can you bowl a doostra or are you more of a millennial and <laughs> get, it, get it down there in the, in the box? I'm a bludger, mate. I uh, blood, <laughs> in the ball, blood in the ball. So, um, you know, it, it, um, it's quite interesting. Like, um, you know, the sporting culture was so uh, prominent in these, in these areas that you had no choice but to play sport. You know, and um, and you know, I've got you know, I'm, I'm you know, people say how does New Zealand produce these amazing rugby players? But for me, it's no surprise because the, the Kiwis breathe, um, you know, they live and breathe sport, don't they? And the culture just um, is so strong there from from a grassroots level. So it was good. It, it sort of instilled that competitive nature, I think, which I've got. I think you know, being ability that ability to function within a team. All these aspects translate to to your work life later on. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I, as I said, like I wouldn't change any aspect of my childhood, but I've got very very fond memories of New Zealand. Mm. On on the contrast, like what was what are your memories of, of Nigeria and Africa? You know, even mentioned Zimbabwe. You, you brought up that that Hobbit quote of out of the frying pan and into the fire. No. Yeah. <laughs> still, not, still not getting much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, uh, Zimbabwe, when we were there, um, Mugabe had come into power and initially, you know, he was thought of as, as, as a bit of a, a light um, in Africa. And he, you know, it was only later that, that his um, rule got very... Very disordered, but uh, we were there in Zimbabwe during the golden years. And mate, I've got really fond memories of Zimbabwe. We we lived in a little village up north called uh, Bindura. Um, great childhood, you know. Just spent outdoors with with, you know, just exploring the bush for hours on on end. Uh, the Africans again, like beautiful people, mate. Um, you know, just really welcoming, very innocent. Um, lovely people. So Zimbabwe, I've got great memories of, but Nigeria, very politically unstable environment. You know what I mean? So I've got I've got memories of riots and robberies, and you know, and and as a kid, you know, I look back and I think, you know, I don't think in any way it's damaged me. It's just given me really context into into the way the world works. And uh, what it's also allowed me to do is every day that I wake up in a country like Australia, and New Zealand, you just appreciate it. You know what I mean? Whereas maybe the people that are born here kind of take it for granted. Hmm. Uh, you know, does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah. You know, for me, yeah, I appreciate every day spent in these two countries um, because they they really, um, it's almost like paradise, mate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mate, I'm not too familiar with the sort of Southeast Asian um, sort of civil wars of, of Sri Lanka. What was, what was sort of driving that unrest? Yeah, look, it's a complicated story, mate. And, and to be to be honest, I, I, you know, I'm not ever someone to kind of reflect on the past. I'm always looking to a new challenge or looking to move on. But fundamentally, what drove that civil war in Sri Lanka? And it's all finished now, of course. Um, you know, politically, it's a very different world, Sri Lanka now. I mean, it's a holiday destination for most people. I mean, it's. But uh, back then, it was driven by um, the Tamils, who were a minority. Um, versus the majority of the Sinhalese. So essentially, the Tamils wanted an independent state, uh, which wasn't allowed. And then subsequently, you might have heard of them, the Tamil Tigers mm-hmm. uh, arose and just conflict. Um, you know, uh, initially when they started off, the Tamil Tigers had a course, but then as with everything, you know, power, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And, 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 you know, they became a problem themselves. Um, and Sri Lanka is actually, you know, it's one of the places where, where child soldiers were groomed. Uh, mm. It's where, where these kids were, were taught how to fight. And, and, and my father could see it coming or my family could see it coming. That's one of the big reasons um, we left. Um, thankfully, we had the means to be able to do that. You know, my dad was a dentist and doing relatively well. But there's a lot of people that didn't have that luxury. Um, and a lot of, you know, needlessly spelt, uh, spilled blood and, 
you know, this is this is the um, issue with a lot of these countries, mate. There's just um, so much corruption, um, so much corruption and conflict, um, which again, you know, going back to Australia and New Zealand, we just don't have. Mm. And uh, very rarely do you see it in the West, but we, you know, not to talk politics, you can see aspects of it starting to emerge now, even in places like America. Uh, it's scary to watch. Mm, absolutely. And mate, you said your, your dad sort of had a, a, a zest for adventure. What was sort of driving his dentistry practice sort of 20, 30 years ago and, and to, to bind up with that adventurous <laughs> sort of side of life? <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, look, he's, a, he's, he's got a sense of humour like a father and, um, you know, he's always seen the funny side of life and, um, he, he, you know, I'm very close to him and, um, you know, he lives in Australia now. He's migrated here to be with uh, us and the kids, his grandkids. But um, he's always just seen light of the world. Do you know what I mean? He, he finds the humour in everything. So, which I think kind of rubbed off on all of us because here we were surrounded in these really interesting environments um, and um, you know and I've come out of it kind of unscathed and it makes me question sometimes like you know you see people that suffer post-traumatic stress disorders and, and so forth and thankfully we've got none of that and I think it was his approach to life that kind of rubbed off on on all of us uh, which is that always see humor in things um, and, and you know um, he to this day mate he still continues to 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 seek adventure he's kind of um COVID's put an end to all of that though <laughs> stuck here yeah no it's, it's a bit, bit bloody rough um thankfully for us here in New Zealand we're doing okay although there's a bit of a question mark hanging over us at the moment but um yeah in, in New South Wales has gone in and out of trying to deal with it eh, mate yeah absolutely absolutely thankfully not too badly impacted thank you mate yeah Mate, um, so one of the things you said that I found interesting that you sort of fell into me medicine, how did you sort of go from one of Dunedin's iconic uh, buildings down the hill to, to another iconic building of, of Otago University and Otago University Medical School? Yeah, uh, thanks, mate. Look, good question. Um, I, I, uh, school was a bit, you know, I, I sympathise with a lot of these children that are now labelled as having ADHD or attention deficiency disorder or these many labels that float around because I really struggled with school, um, you know, the, the academic aspect of it. I, it never really made sense to me. Anything that required rules and having to follow a textbook, I really struggled with. This is why I was drawn to mathematics because I could free think with maths and it, and, and it always made sense. And so, you know, most of my schooling career was just spent not interested. But then um, I remember and it was my father, actually, he, he, he sort of he said a challenge to me. He said, look, um, if you can if you can do medicine or dentistry, that 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 would be huge. And, and I, I just took it upon myself. And within 12 months, like I, I was in university pretty early on in the peace Shrine, like I think I would have been about 15 and a half or 16 and I was, I was already in university. I just sort of blitzed through and it just, it goes to show that a lot of these children that do suffer ADD or ADHD, they're simply not stimulated by something. There's no end goal and uh, often their interests are um, cultured. Mm. Um, so, you know, they just kind of fall through the cracks. I was very lucky, I had some great mentors and mathematic teachers in in, um, in Otago Boys High School and uh, you know I still remember it fondly to this day a chap called Henry Stoddart he um, really took me under his wing and without his guidance I, I don't know kind of where I'd be really um, so you know it just goes to show that that a good teacher can really impact people's uh, people's lives so most of that sort of medicine uh, as I said you know it's just typically the, the it's culturally very um there's a strong push in these type of families asian families to to do medicine do i regret the decision no mate because there's a lot of security in our job do you know what i mean like mm. through covid and and so forth uh, so many industries you see these job losses and it's super sad to see but we just haven't been affected in healthcare. Mm. Mm. um so it's it's at least i've got job security which i'm very grateful for yeah mate um Post-COVID, I sort of downloaded, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman and, and sort of 
got introduced a little bit more to the history of mathematics and physics you know even even having a physics teacher for a dad I, I kind of didn't really you, you spoke about purpose and meaning of of, of the thing you're doing I, having read that book as an adult I kind of wish that those sort of things had been exposed to me and I've started sort of listening to Lex Friedman and again they were talking about some AI that can work out all these complex um, classical equations that proofs you know proofs basically which was was that sort of some of the things that kept you involved and kept your sort of attention to use that word with maths yeah um it's strange with with mathematics i'm just um i'm just able to see it it's really bizarre to explain it like that but it's just always kind of made sense i've never had to sit down and learn it or learn the rules it's it's mathematics it's a very it's probably if there's a language through the universe Ryan, that existed it'll, it'll probably be mathematics mm -hmm. you know, um, it's almost a universal language and and um yeah i mean it was interesting physics again i found very very interesting it it, it just it's hard to explain it Ryan, but it just made sense but Pity a lot of my life now is, is spent outside of mathematics because science is a very different field, but I still try and stay involved. I read a lot of data, medical data and, and go through it. But um, what fascinates me is the corruption within the medical data, mm -hmm. um, in particular with all the pharmaceutical companies that, that bend studies in a certain way to make it fit their narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what sometimes frustrates me in the medical field. It's no longer that. It's really lost that objectivity. Um, and, um, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, can't remember who the American president was. Could have been Eisenhower or someone like that. But um, could have been Ronald Reagan. I can't remember. Um, but, but essentially, you removed the power from the universities, universities to be able to fund studies and brought in this concept of, well, you know, private corporations can fund studies. And that was kind of the decline of data mm -hmm. in, the, in the medical side of things. So um, I'm not surprised that we face a lot of ill health now with our population because um, I, I think we're directionless with regards to where to go um, when it comes to health. Mm. So um, I was listening to, I think it was, Dr. Mark Jordan, I could be wrong. Um, he was on Rogan the other day. He does a lot of work with, have you brought up PTSD, but uh, um, traumatic brain injury with with the military and, and now the the wider community. And that was one of the things he was sort of getting at is that the likes of BMJ or, or JAMA or whatever is co coordinated towards the narrative of, of whatever, you know, is, is sponsoring, I guess, or paying for the ads within the, within the journal. Um, what sort of stuff do you try to dive deeper into? Obviously, that means that you're you're on on your own in assessing assessing the data. You don't quite get the same letters and rebuttals and, and things going on, but even some of them are, are pretty slanted when you're in those major journals. How do you, how do you sort of go and tease through the the uh, masses amounts of data for, for your field and, and and that broader scope? Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? Like, so we've got a database called PubMed, which basically holds all this medical literature. And um, what I tend to do is I, I'm not I'm not picky about which journal these studies go into. Like a lot of my colleagues, when they talk about studies, they'll say, well, it was published in this prestigious journal of New England Journal of Medicine or, or NEGIM or BMJ, as you said, or JAMA. But the reality is like we, we've, I think there was a New England Journal of Medicine editor who came out and said, like, most of these studies are just utter bullshit, uh, you know, and, and she said, like, you know, they're just, they're, they're just geared towards a specific narrative and it's about who you know and what sort of influence and power you hold within these um, industries. So I just tend to read a lot of smaller journals. I'll read a lot of older articles. I mean, I'd go back and eat, read a 60s or 70s, a paper from the 60s or 70s, which um, a lot of my colleagues wouldn't because it's simply not considered new research, but a lot of newer research is just simply geared towards drugs. You know, there's a problem, here's a drug approach, and here's the drug, here's the efficacy of the drug. And oftentimes, uh, very little is sort of looked at with regards to lifestyle, whereas in the old days where there wasn't that profitability of these drugs, they looked at a lot of lifestyle-based studies. You know, they did cool studies like, you know, where even in the 20s and 30s where they locked up a man in a metabolic, not locked him up, I mean, he was free to move about, but where they put him on a diet which was very similar to the Inuit um, or Eskimo diet where he ate nothing uh, but meat, uh, a chap by the name of uh, Wilbur Stephenson. And data like that would show that, that there was no 
no ill health that he incurred, that they don't do studies like this anymore, that curiosity about the human body is kind of lost, you know, about what it's capable of and, and, and so forth. It's all geared towards, well, here's a disease, what drug can we utilise to uh, fix it, um, which I find very unsatisfactory, Ryan. Yeah, I often listen to Peter Tia's conversations and um, sometimes some of the studies they talk about, like, um, getting people's ketones up to a pretty good level and then just pumping them full of insulin and dropping their blood sugar down to basically naught and, yeah. and still carrying on surviving. You're like, golly, that's how you give someone a coma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, isn't that, isn't that uh, amazing? Um, you know, and I guess we've got to function within the ethical aspect of medicine, but uh, that curiosity about the human body that someone like Peter Atia has got is, is lost. Um, we are amazing bits of kit. You know, this human body is an amazing kit and we know so little about it and um, so little about how to keep it working at its optimal. Uh, but, you know, you've got good scientists like Peter Atia and I think he's brought some of that, that good science um, to the mainstream, which is excellent. Mm. Mate, so like in his field, he's concerned with longevity. Um, you brought up no. a couple of outcrops off, off, like you said, the central plumbing. How, how much is the sort of disease end of the spectrum and those of us trying to focus on longevity, how much is that gastrointestinal tract so important? Yeah, it's a great question, Ryan. Like, I, I look at, I, I don't get as granular about it as I think someone like Peter does. Uh, but what I, in my mind, I've really simplified it as best I can. I look at ageing as basically oxidation of the body. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you cut an apple in half and leave the apple out and you come back two hours later and there's there's you know, the apple's gone black or brown or whatever it is, discoloured, that's oxidation, right? It's the same thing occurs to avocados and, and other, uh, other foodstuffs that we leave out. That is essentially what's going on with the human body. And that is what ageing is. So my focus is always on what drives this oxidative damage um, to, the, to the human body. Because if we can basically halt that oxidative damage, I think you're going to achieve um, longevity. Um, so Peter talks about all of that. Um, I haven't followed him closely for the last few years because uh, some of his stuff does get very granular. But what, what, <laughs> um, but, but the, the, some of the aspects that will drive oxidation, if you don't mind if I mention a few of those. Yeah, go for uh, it. Yeah, I'd love to hear. So, yeah, thanks, mate. I think a lot of it can be driven by excess energy. So just calorie overconsumption. Uh, it really damages the batteries within our cells, something that we call mitochondria. And these spew out these things called reactive oxygen species, which basically age the cell inside out. The fact that we've got diabetes, right? And just having sugar circulating out around our system, binding vessels and other organ systems, creating these um, what we call AGEs, advanced glycation end products, I think drives oxidation. Uh, this might be a little bit controversial, Ryan, but I think excessive exercise um, tends to tends to drive oxidation, um, and this is why I kind of I'm I'm, I'm really um, I really push a lot of my clients towards resistance based training where they're where they're maximising exercise within the shortest period of time as opposed to hours and hours of cardiovascular uh, exercise. You know what I mean? I, I think yeah, just I, just I, on on that one, um, Peter had a cardiologist on there on the podcast and I talking about um, a protein breakdown of the heart after about 45 minutes. And that was while I was training for ultra marathon. I was like, Oh, great to know another, <laughs> another thing that's killing me early. <laughs> it took, it took, took seven and a half hours of that day. Oh, golly, it did, did some damage. Still, still recovering. <laughs> yeah, look, I think short bursts of it, no, no doubt. I mean, like from an evolutionary perspective, Ryan, we're, the way we're built, um, you know, we, we're the ape that learned to hunt. Do you know what I mean? We're the mm -hmm. ape that learned to stand upright. We're the only ape that can actually run. And that ability to run is, is our birthright. You know, and some people are drawn to that, and I don't blame them because that is our genetic birthright. It's a genetic memory somewhere in that in that ancient brain of ours, and and we're persistence hunters, right? The species before us, which was the Homo erectus, um, um, they they were essentially persistence hunters. We we lost our body here because we generated so much internal heat, that ability to perspire and and uh, through sweat glands on the Kalahari Desert while we essentially ran animals through exhaustion. 
you know, for eight to 10 hours. And there's still tribes that, that do that in the Kalahari, um, you know, that persistence hunt. These are all, these are all things we did, but, but I think like if, if, you want to maximise longevity, there, there must be ways to tweak um, our evolutionary behaviours to, to try and achieve maximum efficiency. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And and what other um, ox, oxidative causes are there out there? Yeah, there's a lot. And I think one of the issues is that we drive ourselves so much on sugar, right? Mm. We've become accustomed to this philosophy that... that um, you know, sugar is needed for energy, right? Okay, like you and me are of that generation, uh, Ryan, where, you know, like if you're stepping out onto a sports field or, or before an exam where well, you need sugar, right? That's going to be your energy source, right? Yeah, and if you're a marathon runner, that, that you know, that would have been drummed into you, right? Like you need sugar, you need carbohydrate loading. So I think we've gone with a fuel choice that is probably inferior, Right, because I think the true fuel, um, you know, we're a hybrid engine, we can run on both. I think the true fuel that really truly promotes cellular health and mitochondria health is probably fat um, or ketones. Right, so I think, I think the fact that we're running our bodies on sugar is problematic and driving oxidative stress. I think, you know, pesticides and all these chemicals that are being pumped into our system, of course, drive it. I think sunlight, excessive sunlight, can certainly drive it in those. Uh, particularly who have a skin type that might not allow for, um, um, you know, uh, allow for, it may not be conducive to be out in the sun for too long. And I think, you know, obviously factors like smoking or drive oxidative stress. There's many more. Uh, there's many more, but those are some of the more prevalent prevalent things um, which I think might drive it. Um, for me, with uh, the eyes and sort of macular degeneration, one of our key sort of um, independent risk factors is the processed seed oils and um a guy that i've sort of checked in on on twitter is tucker goodrich who suffered severely from diverticulitis and then came to the realization you know you kind of went keto and eating salads and salad dressings and things and he sort of isolated out the processed seed oils and found that that condition resolved is that something that you've come up with or or, or entered your into your field that sort of highly unstable um, process seed oil? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question, um, Ryan. Like, we don't actually, you know, you ask a gastroenterologist, what causes diverticular disease? And they'll mumble something under their breath about genetics um, mm -hmm. and sort of move on. They don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't really know. But the way I tend to view um, diverticular disease, it's a fairly unique perspective on it. But you know, our, our colonocytes or the cells that line our colon run on fat. That is their preferred fuel, right? They run on ketones. They don't really utilize glucose. This is why fiber is such a, you know, considered such a protective thing because our body takes fiber, ferments it into a fat, which is butyrate, mm. which the colon cells love. The problem is, Ryan, let's go back to what we said. Remember, we said we're running our body on sugar, not fat. And so I think diverticulosis is a reflection of that. It's essentially a, a, a colon that's energy starved, right? And, and when you've got diverticular disease, which are these pockets, occasionally it's a probability thing. Some people are prone to getting those infected. Mm -hmm. And when it's infected, it's a very painful condition, you know? So once you've developed diverticulosis, which is these outpouchings, you can never reverse it. It's, it's with you for life. But by minimizing the things that can go into the diverticular, although there's been no good data on it, things like nuts and seeds and so forth, things that are poorly digested by the system, it makes sense to eliminate that because they, they're more likely to end up in there. So this is why, you know, things like ketogenic diets or high protein diets tend to be beneficial because most of the absorption is done upstream in the small intestine rather than heading down into the uh, colon. Mm. And so it, you, you're sort of saying that they're energy starved would be a case that, they're trying to hang on to any fat that they can get their hands on or, or yeah 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 it's um if i could go back with regards to your question on seed oil because i fa faced because uh, i uh, failed to address that seed oils are very interesting i mean they, they, they tend to contain a very pro-inflammatory molecule which is the omega omega-6 linoleic acid um so 
these things get incorporated within the cell layers, these uh, amigas, and that, that drives poor cell health. In addition, they're very easily oxidized. These vegetable oils oxidize very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember, we talked about oxidative damage, um, right? And so I think that's a problem. In addition, you're taking something like, um, you know, like rice, which would contain a little bit of omega-6 and then compressing it into an oil. So you're taking that little bit of omega-6 and hyper concentrating it in a liquid form and consuming it as liquid calories. Um, it, it adds to more energy than we require. It's just energy, refined energy sneaking in. So seed oils, I think, are a big, big issue. I'm still trying to get my head around all the other aspects of ill health that they might contribute to, but I think they're a bad idea, you know. Um, with regards to the second question about the energy starvation, I, I think what we're built to do, right, I think we're built to burn fat. Right, and during times of excess, which would have been very rare in our evolutionary past, we burn sugar as well. And oftentimes, there's we've got such small capacity to hang on to sugar. Like we can, at any given point, we can only hold 500 grams of, of, of carbohydrate or glycogen in our body, which is not very much. And you consider most of us hold kilograms of fat, mm. right? I Many hundreds of thousands of calories we can hold in fat. So a lot of this excess sugar just convert, gets converted to fat, right? And so we, we're never really tapping into our, our fat stores, which is a problem. Like, so even with exercise, we're using sugar to fuel exercise, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a problematic approach. Um, so the colon, I'm not surprised that we're developing diverticular disease very early. It's just we're not burning much fat for energy. And whatever fat we're having, we're having through fibre, which is fermenting and releasing butyrate, but it's a very inefficient method of obtaining fat. Whereas if you're a fat burner, say you're on a ketogenic or a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, you're burning your own fat stores and nourishing the colonocytes with your own fat, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a molecule called beta hydroxybutyrate. It's a cousin of butyrate, but far more efficient and you release it in many, many multiples above what your colon can ferment. I hope that makes sense. It's a bit yeah, more no. anyway. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that, and but um, yeah, it, it might sort of take take a little bit of, of, of further looking into it if you haven't sort of dived down the ketogenic hole. Um, and that sort of brings me to my next question: When people come into the the uh, clinic with you know the, by the time they've got to you, they're already in a, in a sort of level of pain and discomfort. And then you said about, you know, so the sports paradigm is to fuel things on, on sugar, you know, there's Powerade ads, there's you know, the influence of sanitarium across Australasia. Um, and, you know, even when you say so you've got diabetes or whatever, it's, you know, heart healthy, whole grains and all those types of things. When they get into you, how do you, how do you sort of break down that paradigm of, of our fueling and and what we've been brought up with, you know, how many wheat bricks can you, can you put away? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, Ryan, it's a, it's a challenge, mate. It's an uphill struggle because, like, for decades and decades, we've been indoctrinated to go down a certain pathway and you've got that healthy eating pyramid, which is, you know, these kids have been exposed to it from a very young age. And so it's like it is as difficult. And the, the best analogy I can use is, is me walking into a religious institution saying, guys, come on, you know, like, Let's do it a bit differently. Let's let's go out and do it a bit differently. It will it will create outrage, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's kind of how it generally is received. Now, what I find is is people, you know, of our generation and younger, they're a little bit more receptive because we've got the internet. You know, the, the ketogenic diet is such a big. Um, it's not it's not a fad diet because it's a very effective diet with some science behind it, but but it's widespread now, right? Like even though the medical world might not support, a lot of people do it of their own accord and get healthier by mm. dropping carbohydrate content. So in that age group, it's easier, but people that are perhaps your father's age and, you know, 60 plus, a father and mother's age, it's very difficult. It's a challenge because they've had decades of indoctrination. So to get them away from not eating oats, and not eating cereal, it's a challenge, you know? And um, what you learn very quickly is in these elderly groups, they're fundamentally protein starved. They mm. just not eating enough protein not consuming enough and I spend a lot of it saying look protein is non-negotiable it's a building block we must add it in um, and I found that I was just butting my head against a brick wall 
Um, and so I got very frustrated with it and decided that I was going to do it better. And I brought in a team of dietitians now that work with me. I've got three phenomenal dietitians, Jessica Turton, uh, Tom and Nikki, um, who work within my practice. And, and we just work together as a team. Uh, it's a bit of a multidisciplinary approach uh, to it. So I'll, I'll make sure that there's no disease uh, behind their gut issues and I do colonoscopies on them and I broach the topic with them, but then to implement it formally, we've got trained dietitians. So it's a really good model, you know, but it's unique in the medical world where you've got uh, a specialist working alongside dietitians, you know. Yeah, well, I've been lucky enough to speak with Gary and Belinda Picky on here and of course, ended up stepping on a little bit of toes with that how how do your dietitians feel about um prescribing and implementing that sort of advice oh they've got no concerns with it so the lead dietitian is jessica turton she's um published some really big studies in some very prestigious journals like plus one on low carbohydrate diets and ketogenic diets in the setting of metabolic syndrome so she's all over it she's a uh, i'd encourage you to look her uh, look mm. her up and viewers to, to look her up, Jessica Turton, T-U-R-T-O-N. Um, she's got some phenomenal um, resources on, on YouTube in particular. Uh, very, very well published and um, she's all over this. And, you know, I've learned a lot of what I've learned uh, from her as well, some of the practical aspects of how to implement a diet. So we're all on the same, uh, you know, page, which works really well. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's always good to get these um, other anecdotes around, like... Um, in, with my type 2 diabetics I've been introducing them to uh, Dr David Unwin's dietary advice and, and sort of you know slipping in there that hey Western Australia is implementing this at the moment and then I sort of follow that into you know on a larger scale Verda Health's doing this in, in, in America and hey 2018 the ADA slightly changed their stance on low carbohydrate and things and so you know it's like you say with that outer generation that, that looks to authority if you can start to sort of Build a, build a story and build a narrative around that. Actually, hey, there is some authority to the authority to this. There is a narrative to this. Um, and then on the flip side, with the with the type ones, you know, t- talking to them about the Bernstein method and how it was most viewed paper in two thousand eighteen. It's just like, you know, this is, this is this what you want? Is this what you want with your children? Is do you want some longevity? Do you want them having families? You know, seeing their children grow up and things like that. You know, it's just yeah, it's just great to to connect with, on on those sorts of levels. 100 percent 100 percent i'm with you on that you know i'm with you on that and and that we've got to give give thanks to the internet i mean that, mm. that's what's allowed all these people to connect and and join ideas because if we're trapped within these silos with guidelines that are flawed then you, you never really see an escape from that mm. you know but we're an inter- internet savvy um um you know uh, generation so mm. that that's liberated a lot of people and sadly and embarrassingly you know medicine hasn't caught up to that the doctors still haven't caught up to that. You know, you've got leaders in the field like David Unwin, um, but, you know, um, we're still sorely lagging, which, which uh, you know, it's a lot of my practice has been out of keeping with the way that mainstream works. Um, and then that, you know, certainly impacted my practice initially, uh, but I just, I was confident with my approach and, and, and went forward. And, um, you know, I think, we're now starting to see really good results for our patients and we deliver uh, for them. So I've, I've got no qualms of carrying on this way. And I think low carbohydrate diets, there's more than adequate data now that supports their efficacy in type two diabetes. They'll always end the paper with, we don't know about the long-term effects of such a diet, but we don't know about the long-term effects of any diet. Do you know what I mean? Including right. the Mediterranean diets. So, yeah. So um, as, as a professional, you sort of uh, crossing paths with sort of internal medicine, general general practice or is it very much going into the sort of gastroenterology stuff most of the time my 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 perspective on it ryan like i was thinking about it today actually it's interesting to bring up this question is that that one of the biggest flaws within healthcare is that we separate the body Mm. into these these organ systems right like you've got a brain doctor you've got a bone doctor you've got a gut doctor a liver doctor So, so the the reality of the situation is everything just works in its entirety to provide um, health, right? You know, it's, uh, I hate the term, but it's kind of this holistic approach. Um, You know, holistic sort of falls into that realm of um, the non-medical field, but but I think we really need to start applying that paradigm. So I don't um, look at myself purely as a gastroenterologist, I just look at myself as someone who's providing um, hopefully some health advice 
and I try and stay on top of as much of the diabetes data or as much of autoimmune data as I can and also along with the gut stuff. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the human body as a whole. Mm. And uh, I think our, our, our profession has moved away from that. We've become less curious um, about the human body, but, but, but really there's very little that we know about it, you know. Yeah, it's quite quite fascinating. You bring you up, you're thinking about it today. My first patient today was is in the process of studying uh, classical acupuncture, and she sort of went to the liver as sort of the you know the source of all the all the paradigms and things like that. Because she's asking me about toxicity in the eye, and like you're saying, oxidation in the eye, and just so like, yeah, if, if, you know, of course the liver play, plays a role, <laughs> like blood pressure, Absolutely. blood sugar, insulin, cortisol. You know, it's it, it's all it's all you know in, interacting and. And um, yeah, does what happens in the liver affect the eye? Absolutely. Does what happens in the gut affect the eye? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I'm in a privileged position to be here, you know, as a gastroenterology because like a lot of this damage is coming from the gut or the gastrointestinal tract. You know, the, 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 the only thing that's open, truly open to the environment and that allows us to communicate with the environment um, is our gut. You know, we've got our skin, obviously, that communicates with the environment, but that's an impenetrable barrier. You know, other than the UV, nothing else gets through, right? We've got a respiratory tract um, and the sinuses, yes, but we've got meters upon meters of gut that communicates directly with the environment through what we eat and through what we ingest. Mm. And so a lot of this damage, in particular with autoimmunity, um, I suspect it's coming at a, at a gut level and the science is starting to back that, you know, that Hippocrates said all diseases begin in the gut, you know, and there's so much wisdom in, in these ancients, but um, science now start, supports the theory of intestinal permeability in, in causing dysfunctional gut barriers, which then allows communication to the bloodstream, which, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating field, but the gut is closely linked to why we are unwell as a species. And we have to accept that we are unwell as a species. I mean, the argument that's brought up is well, we've lived to 85 and 90, but the quality of life's not great, right? Mm. You know, it's you know, from 50 onwards, it's the slow accumulation of medications. People lose um, fat loss of function, that fragility, mental fragility. Um, a lot of their lives are spent institutionalized, battling cancer, battling... Um, all sorts of illnesses so we've lost that uh, quality and gained quantity and i'd argue i'd argue just to add a final point that that quantity of life hasn't come from modern medicine it's simply come from you know just public health measures you know vaccinations and seat belts and um, you know, road safety and, and and clean drinking water uh, the removal of asbestos lead all these elements and and you know, we're living longer as a result and medicine gets the rap for, well, what well, gets the credit for it. But I don't, I think we've added very little to it, to be, to be quite frank with you. Um, you brought up the Hippocrates there. Is there any sort of element of your heritage in, in Sri Lanka that, that sort of shapes the way you think about things? So do, do you have, do you, do you recognize any of that? Um, I'm not sure, Ryan, you know, I'm not sure. Like um, I'm very much drawn to Africa. Um, I'm drawn to Africa and I, you know, like if given the opportunity, I'll go back there in a heartbeat. I can't wait to take my family back there. I haven't done it yet. Um, you know, I, I was drawn to Africa and I think you'd feel the same if you spent uh, enough time there with the Africa, uh, Africans in, in, surrounded. But I, I, I just feel like we're all, we're all from there. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's this deep connection that you've got to it. Um, we spent the vast majority of our millions of years of evolution in this continent. Um, so I always go back to that. So very little of my memories about Sri Lanka actually um, shape the way I view the world, but a lot of my memories of Africa and what I saw the Africans eat and the way they behaved and that whole environment shapes the way I think now. And this is why I always go back when I do blogs and so forth. I always talk about how we've deviated so much from our evolutionary heritage. Um, and, and that is what is driving this modern day health epidemic, whether it's mental or physical health um, based issues, you know. And, and so do you think that's just like full on immersive connection that, that they've got there in Africa? 
like food used community to, people <laughs> yeah it used to be used to be used to be yes of course now with uh, they're heavily westernized they're surrounded by western um, products so it's like you know like if given the opportunity not to hunt a hunter gatherer will not hunt mm. it is a difficult difficult thing to do often it's compounded with failures in hunting and if you're a, if, you, if you're a bow hunter and uh, you know, you would know that. And I spent some time with a group called the Alpha Humans. They're an amazing bunch of guys here and um, here in Australia. And, um, you know, I watched the bow hunters go out and often return empty handed. Uh, whereas the guys with the guns would go back and always bring, bring back something, but we're all bow hunters originally. Mm. Uh, that's how we did it. And so it's a hard thing to do. Hunting's a hard thing. Yeah in terms of acquisition of food. So given the chat, ch you know, if you were given wheat and flour and sugar and seed oil, you, well, yeah, you know, you would choose the easy way, of course. And I so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's less effort. So the Africa's changed now. Um, it's, it's the westernization of, of these sort of places and, and they are suffering a lot of ill health as a result, you know, mm -hmm. uh, lots of diabetes. They've got an epidemic of, you know, of uh, amazing proportion there. Um, a lot of it's undiagnosed, of course. Um, mm -hmm. So all of that is kind of lost there, but there are still some groups that live the way they're supposed to live, um, but they're hidden away, of course, tucked away. The hazard as an example, but again, the missionaries have introduced seed oil and wheat and bread, and, and so they're starting to see ill health as well. It's like the, the last memories of what we used to be is kind of just being stripped away. And I'm fascinated about the hunter-gatherers and I spend a lot of my time reading about them. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned Alpha Human. Is that, is that sort of Eamon Waddington and things? Yeah, yeah. You know Yeah, yeah oh, I've, I've not met Eamon just yet. Uh, um, Kent, I've managed to meet Kent Mulligan who, who sort of introduced us um, yes. two Christmases ago. But um, yeah, Eamon and I have been back and forth on Instagram a long time and it was awesome today to see him uh, doing the extensions to that, to that shed. How did you get involved with that? And my wife just got sick of me rattling on about our heritage as hunters. And she said, you, you know, do, do you want to do it yourself? I mean, you talk about it a lot. And, and she just booked it. And, um, and, and uh, it was great. I spent time with them. I mean, it's so evident when I spent these two days with these guys, like you've got to have the physical talent to be able to, to hunt. And Eamon's a, I mean, he probably in another life, he would have been a phenomenal athlete. But that level of fitness was interesting. And you can be gym ready and gym fit versus um, fit in, the, in, in reality. And, and um, I just found it just an eye-opening experience. And I think my wife is happy to get rid of me for a 48-hour period. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what, did, what did that experience look like for you? What did, what did you do? So it was interesting. Like, we arrived there late at night and uh, even met us there, they took us back to the camp, they took us through how to butcher an animal. They had um, a chap there, I've forgotten his name, but he was a real character, older chap. And, um, you know, he was a butcher by trade and a hunter, of course, a very good one. And he took us through how to butcher an animal. So it's like very confrontational from the start for a guy like me that's always just wandered to his local butcher and, you know, completely disconnected from the food supply. Um, but it, it was, so eye-opening and as time went on i just saw how much these guys loved it and their passion for it and how much they respected the animal that they killed and and really relished it and uh, they'd talk about sit around the campfire talk about the experiences that they had and it was you know i loved it it was a great experience and i, I wouldn't hesitate to do it again hopefully with some some friends this time where i can um I can kind of help open their eyes as well yeah and physically it was draining it was a really good workout so, so you mentioned that sort of disconnect from the food system. Um, going back to your butcher, did you sort of uh, open your eyes a little bit, enhance the relationship, you know, ask him where, where everything's from, what's he cutting up? Did that sort of move things forward in that aspect? Yeah, no, it's, um, look, I've always been close to my butchers. I, I respect them for what they do. And, um, you know, I'm very fastidious about where my meat comes from. Like most of my beefs, Cape Grim, Australian, 100% grass-fed finished Tasmanian beef, you know, and I'm very fastidious about that. Um, but, it, you know, what, one thing it taught me is that, that exercise is, is something that we kind of hold as separate from nutrition. Like we, we exercise to work off. <laughs> nutrition but the reality is 
we used to exercise to achieve nutrition, right? Mm. If that makes sense, to acquire food. And, and so we've got that complete disconnect and people are mindless about their food. They don't consider where it comes from or how it's there. And, you know, you, you'll see people comment on, well, how do they hunt? That's cruel. Yet they won't hesitate to walk down and buy a kilogram of meat from their local butcher or from their, um, not even the butchers, you know, they won't be able to just go into their supermarkets and buy that. So I think if, if more people did it, it would be an eye-opening opening experience for them, you know. Mm. And, and so I saw so you put up the other day, um, going back to protein uh, lacking in the outer, older population, is, is that as simple as, as eating meat or, or, you know, often, often you'll get pushback, and especially when it comes to hunting circles from people that want to choose other protein sources. Do, do you see a place to maintain that sort of muscle mass? Is it yeah, it, from plant sources? It's, yeah, no, um, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky, uh, Ryan. So there's no doubt, like the science shows us that there is protein that is bioavailable to us that we can digest very quickly. You know, we utilize our mouth to break down pre-cooked food, deliver it to the stomach, then the stomach acid, uh, pepsin gets to work. We cleave protein very efficiently through that then deliver that to the small bowel, which then uses proteolytic enzymes, which breaks down the protein and takes that down. But you consider us now, especially the elderly, poor dentition through a lifetime of uh, just heavy consumption of grain and sugar, right? So they're unable to chew as efficiently. A lot of them don't have teeth, you know, and false mm -hmm. teeth, which can't chew well. In addition, you know, they, they, they all suffer poor muscle tone, poor diaphragmatic tone. So they tend to get a lot of reflux and regurgitation since they're on anti-acid drugs. So the acid suppressed. So this protein that's delivered can't be cleaned efficiently. So they're delivering suboptimally digested food to their small bowel. And so they end up malabsorbing a lot of these foods. So the digestive tract is not set up well. And what we know about the elderly is as they get older, the ability to cleave protein diminishes significantly. It's called the anabolic resistance to protein. So the protein eaten um, doesn't create much in the way of muscle growth. So to offset that, they have to eat more quality protein and they have to try and do it. And there's a lot of good work through guys like Stu Phillips and Don Lehman, who are, who are the experts on protein science, to say that the elderly should be hitting three to four meals a day where there is at least 30 to 40 grams of quality protein. Now you can try and do that through beans and legumes, but they're less efficient. And to achieve that 30 grams of protein, you need to eat a lot more. So with that comes the plant-based toxins, the plant-based nutrients, the carbohydrate content, the fiber, and often you end up malabsorbing that anyway. Um, so, so it's just about being as efficient as we can. And um, this is what we're lacking. We're lacking the efficiency. We're clouded by these nutritional guidelines, but also other things like dogma. You know, some people, their religion doesn't allow for, for meat consumption. So there's many factors that are complicated being a human in the modern world. And you think that um, an optimal way of sort of starting to recoup that would be to sort of slow cook and, and sort of, I don't know, essentially partially digest things, you know, broths and, and, and stews and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's texture as well, right? Like no one likes uh, likes raw meat but yeah absolutely um, those sort of things would be very efficient for the elderly but what we tend to classically see with the elderly it's a very cereal based breakfast morning mm. teas fruit, lunch a salad afternoon tea biscuit and they'll have a little bit of protein so over time like their body runs into a negative protein balance so what it does it just takes from from muscle and bone just goes to the bank and asks for a loan which it can never pay back and um, these people progressively become sarcopenic and osteoporotic. Essentially, they auto-digest. They're digesting themselves. And that is what fragility is. And so at 75 or 80, someone falls over in the garden and cracks up in their hip. No one really questions that. They go, well, they're elderly. But the reality is that is nutrition that's led to that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there is better ways to, um, there should be better methods to try and make sure that the elderly don't end up like that. But we've got an epidemic of osteoporosis. It's very rare that you see someone over the age of 70 without osteoporosis in my rooms, you know. Mm. Um, that's nutrition. Yeah, and, and like I was just talking to my flatmate before, he's just gone off to his, his night shift in neurology, and I sort of said, 
you know, we've had a heat wave here in, in Hawke's Bay, you know, similar temperatures to what you guys have been having the last few months, but yeah, push, push in the thirties. And I said, did you get a bit of um, dehydration in last night? And he said, well, not me in neurology department, but medicine just got hammered last night. And he said the exact, exact, exact thing, thing of people falling over. And if you're sarcopenic and osteoporotic, then that means broken limbs or, you know, dehabilitating things. And again, that all of a sudden jumps your mortality right up there. And like I, I remember um, my grandfather, he lived to 93, but those last sort of year and a half where he was in that state and ended up breaking a femur. And I was like, oh, this this is probably not not going to be too much longer now. You know, it's it's yes. it's, yeah. un, it's so unfortunate that, um, and, and, you know, it got to the state where, like you said, couldn't, couldn't swallow anymore and he was on a liquid diet, but of course that liquid diet was basically straight carbohydrate. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And it doesn't help them. It doesn't no. help them. Yeah. And with with your um with your Instagram, you've sort of gone gone down the sort of meme or or, or provocation route. How how has that been responded? Like um, before, Kent sort of said, "Have you heard of this guy?" I said, "Yeah, I have. I've been following it a long a long time. I've been enjoying the graphics, been enjoying the conversations. Um, you know, things that are eye catching with with great explanations. You mentioned blogging as well, like." What, what what sort of does that provide and, and, and interact? Um, yeah, mate. I, look, I, my life's one big meme. You know, I, I, <laughs> I tend to see the funny side of life um, sometimes. But the reality is, unless you, you you can sort of catch people with this sort of humour, very rarely um, will you actually engage them. Like I put up, you know, like deeply scientific articles and a breakdown of that which very rarely draws people in. We live in this modern era, like we want everything pre-digested and spat out. So like the, the memes and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the sort of humorous slides kind of allows uh, for that. Um, and I guess you could look at it as uh, provocative, especially for the healthcare sector, um, but it needs a bit of a shake up. The healthcare sh sector needs a bit of a shake up. And, you know, and we've got to start pointing out that, that the medical doctors themselves very rarely understand health uh, and fitness. And, and, and that is a criteria to be able to then teach their clients how to do that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I find it very therapeutic, very cath cathartic for me, uh, Ryan, to be able to just verbalise these thoughts. And, you know, I found that you know, some people liked it and, um, and so I've just kept, kept, kept doing it. It's a good way to communicate with the public. There is no other way to do it. Mm. And are you, are you involved with sort of lecturing and, and speaking at any, on any platforms or? Um, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, speaking definitely, you know, I get invited uh, to do sort of low carbohydrate type talks um, a fair bit here locally. Um, COVID's put a, put a mm. major um, hold on all of that, of course, but we've been able to do it online. So I do a bit of that, but the healthcare sector wouldn't, wouldn't embrace this. Like, uh, mm. you know, there's no way I'd be able to openly discuss this within a public hospital setting, for instance. Mm -hmm. And even when I've tried to communicate these ideas with general practitioners in the primary care uh, world, they're, they're, they're not ready, um, you know? Um, so, I just kind of focus on educating the public rather than educating my peers because um, if you've ever known doctors, you'll know that they're very um, they're very type A personalities and very stubborn personalities, and they're not easily amenable to change. Yeah, I, I'm sure plenty of uh, GPs read my letters and think, "Oh, that silly optometrist! What, what does he know?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's interesting, mate. And I said, like I said before. Um, you know, a degree shouldn't qualify you as an expert on health. I think a degree in medicine qualifies you as an expert on disease. It doesn't qualify you as an expert on health. So anyone who's willing to give it a go, and I've got respect for people like yourself and, um, you know, anyone in allied health and even personal trainers and so forth, like I value all of them because they're, they're out there promoting the concept of health, uh, which is what we should encourage more. And, and I told my 22-year-old personal trainer, uh, Nick, um, he's probably the closest thing I've got to a doctor, you know, and uh, it, it's, I think that that's the sort of philosophy that we should all be taking on board, valuing people that are trying to promote health. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was involved with some real movement stuff during COVID and that was definitely one of the messages a few of the speakers in their group were sort of getting across. It's, you know, doctors maybe once every quarter for, for a lot of people and, you know, that's if you're lucky. And then, you know, in my profession, we, we sort of do every once every two years and then, but a personal trainer, as you say, some people are spending a couple of hours every week and some, some people are even doing that every single day. And so you, you're exactly right. If they're concerned with health, they're pushing um, you know, that longevity, that, you know, making sure they're strong, making sure they're healthy, making sure they're functioning, making sure they're sleeping and all the all the things and, and providing a, a connection. Well, they're doing an amazing job, aren't they? Gen general practice right there. <laughs> 100%, mate, 100%. And, and like keeping people out of hospital, you know, from an economic perspective makes sense. It's, it's, it's going to, you know, lessen uh, dollars required by the healthcare sector and, and hopefully redirect funds to where they're needed. Do you know mm. what I mean? And, and uh, unfortunately, medicine doesn't see that that way. I mean, the the, the hundreds and well, millions of uh, dollars spent on these newer agents, these newer drugs, which they keep pumping out. I'm, I'm fundamentally, un, you know, I'm uneasy about that. Mm. You know, I think it's all it should be about. Well, how do you not require the drugs? It just requires deeper thought. But you look at our leaders. You know, you look at our leaders. You look at our health ministers, and these people don't understand health. I mean, a lot of them are clearly metabolically unhealthy, um, not from an, uh, you know, from an aesthetic perspective, but it's quite evident to see a lot of them probably would have metabolic syndrome. So how can these, these people value health? And that's why I'm not optimistic about the future. Um, and maybe that comes through sometimes in my posts as well. I can be quite cynical and not overly optimistic, but I worry, you know. Mm. Yeah, you brought, brought up a good topic there of keeping people out of hospital and the irony of COVID and the flat, flat in the curve thing was keeping people out of a hospital, but um, little attention was paid to overall health and, and wellness of, of the population. Again, keeping people out of hospital. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, COVID can be a, a death sentence for some and, and um, almost nothing for others. And what separates that from what we're seeing, the clear trend is metabolic health. Mm. And um, here's nature trying to speak to us, I think, and we should listen. And I hope, you know, people take this, this illness, which I think we're going to have for eternity. I, I don't think COVID's going away anytime soon. Um, and I wonder about the efficacy of the, the vaccination. Um, you know, it'll be really interesting. Like I'm, I'm pro the vaccine. I'm not anti Vax, but um, I think the deeper issue is metabolic health. Is mm. how do we improve metabolic health so that when they do get COVID, it's not not the the death sentence that we're seeing. Yeah, and it, I quickly dive back to um, the sleep topic. Uh, was the name Matthew Walker talking about efficacy of vaccination to do with sleep and, and metabolism? Partly because what do you say? Like one hour less of sleep just great, greatly increases your insulin resistance and, and again, your metabolism and all, all those factors. And so even in the process of having the vaccine, if you can optimise your health for that too, then you're going to improve the efficacy on, on the long term. Whereas if we're as a population um, metabolically unwell, aren't sleeping well, are all stressed, then well, maybe the stress might help but in, in the acute phase. But um, what, what are we going to see with this rollout? You know, is it going to be that... Um, <clears throat> sort of study paradigm where we get what do they say seventy to ninety two percent, or are we going to drop drop down to you know of the people that take it only fifty percent got covered? That's right, and that that's one. It'd be interesting to see what the data reveals. But um, I know what I'd rather choose for myself, my family, my patients. It's it's talk to them about improvement in metabolic health. That is clear, clearly the most important factor here you know, good control of their blood sugars, reversing their diabetes. This is this is the sort of language that we should be talking. Mm, absolutely. And um, it's been acknowledged on a, on a World Health stage that di diabetes is reversible, but doesn't seem to come through from the patients, which, you know, as the optometrist being the first person to tell them, I, I think that's sad. Yeah, no, but, but keep doing it, right? Keep doing it, you know, and that, that um, you know, they... they people need to know that diabetes is reversible and quite easily reversible in some situations, you know, within four to six weeks, you can see, you can flick someone out of diabetes, it's essentially a carbohydrate intolerant state. Um, you know, I'm simplifying it there, but, but fundamentally what drives it is the fact that these people are told this is what they should eat. Nutritionists telling them to eat six, seven meals a day with heavy carbohydrate density because they need the sugar for yeah. energy. 
um, what a what a broken paradigm that is. <laughs> yeah, I when when people really sort of start getting curious with me, I take them to um, Jason Fung's case studies of twenty year insulin dependent diabetics and alternative day fasting with low carbohydrate diet. The longest it took was sixteen days, like I said, two two to three weeks, and you know what. <laughs> What a, I don't know how the person felt at the end of that 16 days to no longer be diabetic, but did they sort of look back on the previous 20 years and go, what, what, what was I told? What, what has happened to me? What, you know? Yeah, that's right. I mean, as a patient, you, you can't help but feel anger probably at the system. Um, but as a doctor and as an optometrist, if you're alerted to the system, it, it is, you know, I can't help but feel angry about the system and how it works. And I'm sure at some point you you do too. Mm. Um, so and, and that that's fine. Um, that makes that kind of lights a fire for me. It makes me passionate about what I do. And I am angry. I am angry at the way the system works. And um, you know that you know I certainly explain I'd spend that time explaining it to my patients. And some of it, some people take that away um, and, and change their lives, but not all will. Yeah. Um, but that, that needs to be you know you need to spread the message and leave it up to them whether they take it on board absolutely mate um where do people track you down you're on instagram where else can people sort of find you um primarily on instagram i found it a good visual medium to get the message across i'm a visual guy um a lot of those things will go through to facebook as well dr pran yoganathan um is the is the handle um and you know, I've I've got a website. I've put a few blogs up there. I'm not as active on that as I'd like to be, but I'll start increasing that in time. It is important to have a digital footprint um, or a presence, right? Uh, we're we're moving into this modern world where um, where this is how people communicate and learn. Um, and medicine's being very slow. Um, the the fact that I'm on social media, my colleagues kind of uh, look at that as somewhat unusual. Uh, but <laughs> um, you know, usually it's been in the realm of the plastic surgeons and the cosmetic surgeons. But um, I'm trying to load up as much information as I can on my Instagram page and, and deliver it to people in an easily digestible form, with hopefully a little bit of humour. Yeah, mate, I'm I'm a big fan, and you and Kent sort of sent me through your profile. I was like, yeah, I know the guy; he's awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. No worries, mate. So, what I typically get people to leave us with is um, sort of a thought or a paradigm or a way you live your life. It can sort of be a quote or or something that always shows up when things are going right, or or sort of keeps you in that in that flow state. Um, what would something like that be for you? Yeah, I think, uh, Ryan, the way I view life is that, um, uh, you know, we are still fairly primitive um, species of, of, of uh, you know, that's existed for many millions of years. And I, I think the way I view life is that we've got primitive instincts that drive us, but what separates us from from all these other animals is that we're conscious of that. We know what's happening. We know that we are floating on a rock in the middle of nothing in this universe. And I think it's really important to be mindful of that and, and for people to have curiosity. We're all born as scientists. That's a famous quote, but we just lose it along the way. So I think people need to stay curious, not accept status quo and um, always look to our past to see how we were supposed to live so that we know how to live in the future. I think that that's, um, that's important for me. Beautiful, mate. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. I'll let you get back to your, your three boys after an awesome day together and, uh, and your wife. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on board. This has been absolutely awesome. And, and I'm sure everyone will enjoy uh, hearing your thoughts. Pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate it, mate. And uh, a special thanks to Kent for um, linking us up as well. Absolutely. Cheers, man.